Welcome to Living History. I'm your host, Mike Hauser, and today I'm very pleased to have as our guest in studio, Mr. Raul Gutierrez. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a resident now of the Caneo Valley for how long? Since 1956. And what was your reason for coming to the Caneo Valley? Well, I was looking for a job at the time. I had just immigrated to the United States legally this time and had been married, had a little baby, and I needed a job. And I started in Oxnard and kept stopping all the way. I was going to keep going east until I found a job. And there was a job at the Oakdale Market in Thousand Oaks. Now, you had a very interesting occupation. What was that? Well, I first went to work as a box boy, just carrying out the groceries and stuff like that. A million stories I can tell you about the interesting people that lived here then. But I didn't get along with the owner's wife. The owner had had a heart attack before I came to work there. And his wife was hard to work for, so I switched with one of the other guys that was in the meat department. He came to work on the grocery side, his name was Dick Lee, and I went to work on the meat end of the business, the meat department. Now that included butchering, which is really quite a deal. For Bruce Oxford, that was the other butcher. He's the one that showed me the, how to cut meat and kill beef and et cetera. Tell us a little bit about the Oakdale Market. What was it like working there? It was wonderful. It was the hub of town. Everybody met there. Everybody. I remember a fire in Sherwood, you know, the Lake Sherwood, and nobody could go in there. And there were all these movie stars had their houses in there, so they were interested in what happened to them. So there's a market full of movie stars. You wouldn't believe the movie stars they had in there. Eve Arden and her husband, Brooks West, Brandt, God, I can't remember them all. They're all there worried about their property and they had nowhere to go, so they were at the market drinking sodas and wondering what was happening to the homes. Now, for a long time, you've been interested in the political scene here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, give us an idea of some of the issues that have come up over the years and, and what you've thought about some of the decisions that have been made. First of all, I had a house and at the time there were no sewers. I had a house and we were on a septic tank. Mm -hmm. Now this ground here is adobe. Best percolation you can get on the ground is about two feet. So you have a septic tank and it gets filled, especially if you have kids. And I couldn't wait for the city to be, to Thousand Oaks to become a city. And of course I was very involved in trying to promote that. And I remember Alex Fiore, the head of that, and some other people that I can you know think of it right now but they were very instrumental Alex was at the top yeah tell us a little bit more about your impressions of uh, Alex and some of the some of the things that he helped bring bring to the Canal Valley you know who it reminds me of or somebody that reminds me of Alex is Major Giuliani they have the same kind of a voice they have the same accent and they talk the same way it's just incredible and is that energy that Alex brought to Thousand Oaks and no question about it and the vision he had because he so years into the future, there's no question about it. And uh, when we finally did become a city, he was instrumental in doing this. Now, a lot of people in here that didn't want to incorporate, they just wanted it to stay like it was. And of course, others saw the need to become a city, but the first two times that I went for the vote, it didn't pass. So the third time, and again, it was Alex, I talked to him about this. Instead of saying, should we become a city or not, it was on the ballot. If we do become a city, should it be Conejo City or Thousand Oaks? And of course, everybody said Thousand Oaks. It did pass. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, how has Thousand Oaks changed over the years? Uh, pretty much as it was predicted. I mean, remember, we are next to Los Angeles. It's a big metropolis. Not necessarily the best metropolis in the world, but we are next to that and we get a lot of stuff from them. I think more than accepting them, we have to kind of defend against that onslaught that they brought. The 101 doesn't help because, you know, it just goes right through the city. And uh, it could have been a hell of a lot more built up than it is now. I think the city has followed the general plan quite well. It's another story about the general plan. But that's uh, Well, tell us about the okay. general plan. <laughs> well, the city was first a city and then they reminded us that we had to have a general plan, so it just kind of like putting the horse behind the cart, 
people did work very hard, and the last very last day that we could get it in there, it was put in. But good people worked on it, and it's pretty much uh, predicted what has happened in here. The vision that the forefathers here had is incredible. I actually saw a city being born, a great city, not just any kind of a city. What do you think about Thousand Oaks as it is today? I think we're one of the best cities in the United States. I have no doubt about that. I've never been outside of the, in Europe or any of the other countries, but uh, I can tell you I've been quite a bit in the United States and I wouldn't, I wouldn't move here. It's, uh, from here, it's, it's, it's great, safe. I mean, we are one, one in two safest cities in the United States. The weather's great. And I, uh, I don't know, I just like the people around here. You're a big supporter of uh, open space and the concept of, you know, retaining some open lands around the city. Tell us how that all came about. Absolutely. I have this, I spoke with Alex Fiore about it. He was talking about it at the time it was happening. The builders would come in here, and by the way, I am for the developers. Developer, to me, is not a bad word. I do like open space as much as anybody else or more, perhaps more, because I don't think we can get one without the other. It was the developers that provided that open space, and it happened this way. They would come and they said, okay, we got, and this is just to make things easy, we got 100 acres, you want to put 1,000 houses in there. And Alex would say, well, that's great, but you know, it is our policy that the first thing you have to do is donate half of your acres, so give us 50 acres and then we'll talk about what you can put on the other 50 acres. And the developers thought Alex was nuts and they ran away screaming and they said, well, take you to court. And Alex would say, well, that's our policy, so if you want to build here, you know, that's our policy. The word policy is interesting in here because if it was a law, it could be outlawed, but you can't do a darn thing about policy and the judge would say, you want to build there? It's their policy, what are you going to do? Go elsewhere if you don't like it. And they did go away, and then a while back, they came back, their hat in their hand, and they'd say, where do you want your half? And Alice would say, well, I tell you what, you take the flat parts, we'll take the hills. We'll be fair about this. Were you a supporter of the uh, Oaks Mall when it was being planned? Yes, of course. It's, you have to think of it this way. They talk about development as if, uh, some people talk about development as if they don't want it. And there were those in here that didn't want it. I wasn't one of those because I consider it just like the sun coming up. There's not much you can do about it. The only thing you can do is direct what you do about the sun coming up. You're not going to stand in the sun and burn, and you're not going to let the developer come in and run wild, but it had to come, and it's a great asset to the city. I, I Speaking of assets, what about the uh, Civic Arts Plaza? I was in favor of that also. I. Uh, I was born in Mexico and I was fortunate to be part of a family that was very culturally involved. And my aunt, my grandmother, of course my mother, they would always go to anything that had to be a cultural aspect, community concerts comes to mind, and et cetera. And I was always dragged to those things. So I grew up knowing this and I'd come to Thousand Oaks and there really wasn't much of that. In fact, eventually the community concerts came to Thousand Oaks and we were meeting at the in Newberry Park at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which was at this time the gymnasium. And we had a good time, and it was good, but it was a gymnasium. And then one time, they had this group that had a song that had to do with drink. I think it was something like drink, drink, drink. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventist says, no, no, you can't perform. And uh, so we're all sitting in there waiting for the performance to start, and here comes Mrs. McGowan, who I think was the most gracious and classy lady I ever met in my life, and she says, we got to go home. This is their home. They don't accept this, and we're just visitors here, so go home. And I kept thinking, wow, that's not right. we got to have our own thing, and I always knew it would happen. I didn't realize that it would be such a fight, but it was Alex and Frank Schill, of course, that really wanted to put it through, and I love it. I mean, it's a, it's a thing that needed to be done. I think the gardens of the world are a plus. I didn't expect that. Mr. Hogan to be so gracious, I think it's wonderful. 
And we're going to have the thing I always envision, a center. The city has always lacked that center. And even though we have the Civic Cars Plaza, I think we need more of a heart, if you will. I can't wait for the east side to be developed. And again, politics, good Lord, we're so glad and so happy to have Caruso do it. Good Lord, it couldn't get anybody better than that. And we got the naysayers, I call them potatoes, griping about the giveaway and the whole thing. I mean, let's face it, that place can, be, can make money if the city wanted to. But I don't want the city to put a retail center and go in competition with everybody else. So pretty much has to be a nonprofit thing, which is going to be for all practical purposes. So we can't really charge a hell of a lot for the, for the land or to have the place in there. But some people don't see it that way. I can't wait for it to be developed the way they have it. And I think it's going to be great. Any other people besides Alex who you think were really instrumental in getting Thousand Oaks off the ground? Yeah, Chuck Cohen. God, I, I think that's the most brilliant man I know. And his wife, Lois, she's, she's great. Dr. Olson's son-in-law and, mm -hmm. and daughter. And, uh, oh, I'm afraid I'm not prepared. Enough. Phil Gatch is very instrumental in here. And all, all these guys that are retiring. I, I know we had a couple other city managers before Grant Brimhall, but I don't think there's anybody better than Grant. I was devastated when he quit, but he had to. He had to. It's just uh, the political situation, again, had gotten pretty ugly. Here's what I see. They call the good old boys and the old guard and everything, some of the naysayers. And yeah, I, you know, sign me up. I'm one of the good old boys, I suppose. But they come in here and they said, everything's wrong and nothing is right. Put us in fours. We're going to run it the way it should be. Big deal. Why don't you go to Pacoima and straighten that place out? That needs to be straightened out or what's if they want problems. This city has no problems compared to what the other cities around come around here. But no, they want to fix this city. <laughs> and that just, you know, doesn't, doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me. What's the greatest uh, challenge facing Thousand Oaks as we uh, move forward? It's not only Thousand Oaks that has this problem and this, this housing uh, there. Quite a few places have run out of place to put the low income people that can work and it's going to be difficult for them to live here and work here. And I don't know what to do about that. The better we make the city, the higher the real estate goes, that is a problem. And I, I don't have a solution for it. I think that I was in the mayor's round table and kept in a member for, I don't know, six, seven years and kept in touch with what the city has done about that, what the cities have done about that. And I think we're at the forefront, but none of them, including Thousand Oaks, is doing as much as could be done. It's, it's not that easy. It really isn't that easy. And, and the Thousand Oaks problem is harder than some of the other cities. I mean, you can go to Fillmore and you can get lower income houses over there because there isn't the demand for housing that you have in Thousand Oaks. And, you know, we're getting world-class people in here like the Amgen brings and some of those other industries in Newberry Park and all that. And they're demanding housing. And they come in with lots of money because they have good jobs and all that. So the lower end gets squeezed. And that's a problem. Just a couple more questions for you. What's your most memorable experience here in Thousand Oaks? I have to think about that one there. I have so many. Well, name a couple then. <laughs> I think working at Oakdale Market. When I first came to town, I told you I was looking for a job. I didn't have a job, and I just wanted to get the first place that gave me a job. And uh, had a new baby recently married, 21 years old. And one night, my wife wasn't feeling well, so I decided I would go out and get me a cup of coffee, a hamburger, and the Saturday evening post. I couldn't do that on Saturday night here at 8 o'clock at night, because all the places I said, cafe of some sort or another, there were bars. The only uh, pharmacy in town was, co of course, closed at 6. And none of them had coffee. I could get a beer or anything else to drink, but no coffee. And I said, this town sucks. I'm out of here. I just as soon as I can. But then I realized the kind of a place it was and 
now you couldn't blast me out of here now. Any advice that you'd have for future generations here, future um, leaders of the city? Any advice you'd want to give them? Future generations and future leaders. Okay, the leaders, of course. I just want them to follow on the footsteps of the ones that built the city. Future generations, I wish they could discern the difference between the ones that criticize the city and the ones that really have to do what has to be done, which is not always popular. See, and they have a job to do. And at least one council member I can think of that came in one door and now is definitely operating out of the other side. And I hope it's because he saw what really needed to be done and not the, uh, what they bring us kind of a baggage. I, we had some member, council members that I call them mentally constipated. They come in with one idea and they're not going to change their mind no matter what you do to convince them otherwise. So you have two people what, you know, advice. You have the future leaders and I have their advice that they can see what has been done and try to follow up on that. And then the people, I wish they would be more involved and aware of what is happening and not just go with the sound bites or the people that come in with a ton of money and good, good advertising. Advertising pays. Scares me to death to have somebody with an amount of, you know, a large amount of money and just buy the election. And let's face it, the next one coming up is going to be an off year election. I mean, it's only the state here. Those are the ones that scare me to death because people turn out for the presidential elections, but not so much on the others. So, What's your future here going to be like in Thousand Oaks? What plans do you have? Well, I'm getting old. I'm getting ready to retire. I don't work very hard right now. I, <laughs> this is something that I'm very proud of, and I haven't told anybody. This will be the first time it gets on the, on the air in any kind of a way. I have a patent. A United States patent. Now that's a piece of paper until you get somebody to want to do something with that. And I finally convinced this big outfit into producing my patent. And I'm sitting here in pins and needles. I got a call yesterday and they said you want three inch wheels or two inch wheels. And I said three inch wheels. But let me see the two inch wheels. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's going to be my future. I, I don't know what I'll bring but I'll be working a lot on that. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. Mike, thank you very much. It's my pleasure, believe me.